Recently, I got some bad news. It catapulted me into fear. But I soon realized my fear would only make things worse. To deal with what I was facing, I first had to face my fear. So I set off around the world to find out all I could about fear. Fear is an important functional element of the biological imperative. It is what motivates us. I mean, every choice you make in fear will get you more of the same. So the body is continually behaving as if that's happening now. In other words, the body will memorize that emotion and the body will become the mind of fear. Come with me on my journey. You don't have to live in fear. When we spoke last time, you talked about, yeah, the one I'm working on now is facing fear. It was like, oh, that's so appropriate for me, dear God. And it, I mean, as it is for so many of us, but you know, the nervousness that I feel now, even though, you know, I like you, mate, otherwise I wouldn't have invited you back for the chat. I really enjoyed our last one. And yet I still feel, you know, I still have these fears of expectation of, I want to do this well. I want, I want Bill to think I'm great. But that's all ego-based stuff. Well, you know, it's really interesting you say that because um, um, in a couple of the interviews that I did with some of the people for the film, I said, I asked the question, and oftentimes it was towards the end of the interview, I said, um, what are you afraid of right now? And it was a very confronting question because I had to really sort of dig right back. Um, and some of them, in, in their honesty, said, I'm afraid of this interview. <laughs> you know, it was um, for the very things that you're talking about. But, you know, Tim, I, I mean, we can get into it more later, but but one of the people that I interviewed said something really that stuck with me. She said her name is uh, the Reverend Zoe Inman, and she said um, one of the greatest fears is the fear of what other people will think of you. And if you get rid of that fear, it just loosens up a whole lot of stuff. Um, you know, it really does. It, it, you know, you, you don't you don't worry about getting old or looking old. You don't worry about um, you know necessarily what you say. I mean, you've got to be courteous and respectful and so forth. But but all of these things. But but I thought about that. You know, the the greatest fear is the fear of what other people think of you. And one of the things that I'd like to talk about later on, when it's appropriate, is is this belief that I've come to, and I've never, I've, I've just not read it anywhere. It's not that I've, or any of the interviewees actually said it, but it was just my sort of drilling down and drilling down and drilling down into fear. And I came to this sort of bedrock of loss, you know, that, that, that all fear in some form stems from a fear of loss. And if we can, you know, peel back the onion layers and peel them back and peel them back, what you end up with is you end up with some form of fear of loss. Now, in the case of what other people think of you, it's a fear of loss of respect, or loss of station in life, or loss of status, um, you know, loss of self-esteem. Um, you know, there's a number of things that can factor into that. But this notion that that all fear in some form or another stems from a fear of loss is really interesting. And, I, and I've, you know, I've tried to find a fear that's not, and I've asked people, I've asked, you know, very esteemed people if they can give me a, a fear that's not based in loss, and, and no one's been able to yet. And there might be one, you know, somebody listening to this now might might come up with one. But, you know, on on the occasions when people have, Proffered something, I've I've gone back to them and said, yeah, but what about this? What about this? What about this? And it ends up in, as a fear of loss. And of course, the greatest fear of loss is fear of loss of life, which is death. Yeah, hmm. yeah. It, it is interesting. It's a really, really interesting observation because, yeah, I mean, as soon as I, th I think about you know many of 
the, the fears, um, they go straight into loss, straight, straight, straight away. And then I can see, well, okay. So, you know, we usually look back at trauma points in our childhood days as the source of the, the conditioning that we then live our lives by. And I can see straight away, you know, oh yeah, that was a, that was an instance of loss and that triggered so and so straight away from what you're saying. It's a really interesting point. I've not thought about it before like that. Do you think that that stems from, uh, you might not be able to answer this. It is one of my classic sort of questions. Do, do you think that stems from the ultimate separation of, from, from when we are uh, removed and detached from uh, spirit? Uh, we come into this form and we are lost in a sense because we have to find ourselves again. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. I think, um, this point of separation is absolutely correct. And I think that, um, f you know, just, just for me, just, um, just when I do experience fear, it's because I have lost my connection to the, to the divine in some form. And when I reconnect, that fear goes away. Now, not everybody is going to have that belief system, um, but it works for me. Yeah, yeah, and I can understand that absolutely. What we then battle is that uh, um, that ability to connect wholly. So again, we go to connect from here rather than here, because here is not connecting. <laughs> here is connecting, and so many of us, I think. Yeah. For people who are listening to this and don't have a television, Tim is referring to his heart, and then he refers to his head. So uh, given that I'm a visualist, <laughs> I thought I would just point that out. Yeah. Uh, and he and he clutched his heart with both hands very emphatically, and he and he touched his head very delicately, as though it's very important up there. So anyway, I just thought I'd give a bit of a reference for people who don't have a TV. No, that's great. Um, and... Uh... The, there he goes again. Yeah, there I go again. I'm now touching my heart again with both, uh, or where I believe my heart to be, with both hands, because it's a very cherished thing. Uh, exactly. It's not so much. Um, so th this being my brain, the heart connection is um, our remote. We, re we relate the heart to the emotional response, and therefore fear is affecting the heart. Uh, we could say, well, the heart is affecting fear. We're manifesting our experience of the emotions from fundamentally our heart. I was I was leading in uh, in a thinking process to Dr. Joe Dispenza, yeah. who you have in the movie. Um, and by golly, did he give you some value for uh, content, uh, as you would expect. Um, mm -hmm the heart-based living, the intentional living, being able to focus from the heart and connect is mm. pretty intrinsic to Dr. Joe's work. Um, what, what are your feelings about that I and mean, that whole kind of process? Look, Dr. Joe is a bloke who gets interviewed all the time. And he goes into rote, you know, and, he, and, he's, and he's got this stuff that he says, and he says it time and time and time again. And the reason he says it time and time and time again is because it's full of wisdom, it's full of insight. Um, it's something that he's worked through intellectually and also through his through his research work because he's a consummate researcher. Um, but the and there and there is a there is a but. I was more interested in, in his personal kind of attitude to fear. Um, and you might you might remember in the film when I said, look, people say there are two states, there's love and there's fear. And he came back immediately and he said, no, there's not. There's yeah. not. That's wrong. And then he explained why it was wrong. And it made absolute sense what he said. You know, but he goes against the common common thinking in that respect. Um, and getting back to your question, I'm not quite sure what heart-based living means. I, I think if um if you live with compassion and live with empathy, and if you and if you live with um, an appreciation for what for for other people, 
and their lives. I mean, lately I've been looking at people in a totally different way. Um, you know, somebody cuts in front of you in the traffic, and whereas before I would have, you know, raged and honked my horn and thought horrible thoughts, now I think, God, that bloke's probably having a really bad day, you know, or, you know, he's really under pressure at work and he's got to get something. He's got to, he's got to be somewhere fast. You know, and so you start to look at things in a totally different way. And I think if this is heart-based living, then, then perhaps that, that's it. That, you know, that you see the world with greater empathy and, and, and you see dimensions to people that, that you weren't really seeing before, largely because you're so caught up in your own world. Mm. Um, and I think pro probably, you know, it's a little bit of getting older as well and experiencing things. And, you know, we, we had a dreadful situation um, here in Australia. It's been a shocking story, a uh, news story. Uh, an 18-year-old kid took um, some young school kids out in a car and he crashed the car and he killed five kids ages 14 to 16. He was the only one that survived. And he's 18 years old. He's been charged with all sorts of um, big crimes. I don't know whether he was on drugs or drunk or whatever, but it doesn't really matter. You know, but five, five young children were, were, were killed in this car crash and he miraculously um, came out of it alive. You know, my first reaction was, you poor bugger, you know? You poor, poor kid. How are you going to live with that, you know, for the rest of your life? Putting aside, you know, any kind of prison time or anything like that, I just felt enormous. I felt enormous sorrow for him and for and for his for his family and of course the families of all the, the young children, you know. And I thought there's going to be a there's going to be a real lynch mob out for this kid, you know. They're they're going to they they're really going to go for him and they're going to they're going to um, and if he gets before a judge, you know, or, or a jury, then you know he's he's going to get hammered. I just thought, my God, just one stupid mistake and your life is ruined. And just how tragic that is. Although there is also uh, a, a huge opportunity there for him to actually reverse that around and who knows what he might do with his life. As a result of that tragedy, yes, I, I completely get what you're saying because you do. I mean, I think you know, you think, well, my God, what the, can you imagine living with that? Mm. No, you know, you that's what your mistake did. That, as you say, that young kind of uh, yeah carelessness uh, in a way, uh, you know, probably out having a good laugh, and wow, that turned, but. Mm. It is a, you know, if we look at things from that point of view, that there are forces that guide our experience of life mm. and they impact us, and we have a choice about how we react to these things. Mm. That's he, very true. He could well build on that and he could become, he could be amazing. Yeah. In, in no, no that, that's absolutely true, Tim. And, um, you know, one of the things that uh, Carolyn May said in um, PTS, the film on intuition, and I think it's probably for me, it's the most powerful thing that's said in the film. And I've thought about it, I've thought about it a lot ever since. She said, "What's a bad thing? How do you know something is a bad thing?" Um, and this instance, you know, with this with this young driver, how do you know it's a bad thing? Um, you can apply that. You can apply that to all of these tragedies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, we 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 touched last time on a, on a tricky question where I talked about point of view and perspective, but that's what you're talking about. Because if you shift the perspective, you know what what quantifies something as being bad, what quantifies something as being evil. Mm. Right, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a, these are all forces of for change. Mm. And I, oh. I refuse, I refuse to acknowledge the word evil, just as I refuse to acknowledge the word hate. Um, I have taken these words out of my vocabulary, and I've had dinner party conversations 
<laughs> which have got quite heated with other people, not me, um, but other people have got really heated at my at my attitude to this. And they talk about, you know, everyone reverts to Adolf Hitler. I don't think Adolf Hitler was evil. <laughs> oh, I can I can imagine the conversations. Um, yeah. he, 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 he is the classic that we all revert to with the what we would consider archetype of evil. But absolutely, it depends from the point of view. He didn't think he was evil. No. I mean, he was doing some qu quite peculiar things. I mean, look, you cannot, we cannot, whoa, the, the indignity, I could feel indignity mm -hmm. rising in me about thinking about, well, how can you kill millions of people or instruct others to kill millions of people and then not apply the label of evil to it? Mm. It's it's a very interesting one. I don't think that's evil. Now, that's not to say that in any way you condone it or you can um, justify it or anything like that. Um, and we might, might be talking pedantics here, but um, who was it? A uh, famous uh, sculptor said, uh, the tragedy of life is that everyone has their reasons. <laughs> Um, you know, he had his reasons. Um, and, but I, I, I you know, look, I'm, I'm, I've got to say that I'm informed quite a bit by Paul Selig's work in this respect, where he says that everybody is a, a spark of God. And there are, there are no exceptions to that. And if you're a spark of God, then how can you be evil? Um, you know, you, you can have... You can have uh, mental health issues. You can um, be detached from reality because of a chemical imbalance in your brain, all of these kind of things. But for me, that doesn't qualify as evil. Uh, uh, so, so as you say, maybe pedantics, but <clears throat> so therefore, if it doesn't qualify as evil, how would you qualify that word that you have Oh, or are you simply saying, well, no, I refuse to accept that that actually even is a label that is appropriate for anything? I do. I do. Wow. Coming, back, coming back to this notion that, that we all are a part of God um, and, a, and we're a spark of the God force, um, how can that be evil? Um, I, I just refuse to accept that a part of God, there is any part of God that is evil. Okay, but it's our perception of uh, the intensity of actions which we feel as human beings are detrimental, I'll use the word detrimental, at this end, so we could have a normal, everyday, non-committal emotional response to something, we can go this way mm -hmm. and we'll end up in something that we re reflect as love, mm -hmm. and, and we go this way and we end up most of us in something that we we label as evil because that in our way of assimilating information is part of the duality of our existence so we have love and evil i'm not saying i mean in in your movie in the facing fear movie you you obviously you have a sequence where you're talking about fear and love being uh, balanced uh, opposites I'm not talking about these two things being balanced there. I mean, fear is somewhere along that spectrum. But evil can be a part of God, because as you say, and Paul says, and, and many spiritual traditions say, God is in everything. And therefore, if our reaction to something is that that is, that is evil, then it is present. Um, I put that question to Paul um, in the interview. And he says that the the problem is that, and he he refers now to fear, not evil. Oh. It can, but it can be, oh. it can be um, extrapolated to to be the same. He says, um, I'm just trying to recall his words now, but he says the problem with fear is that fear doesn't realise that it's a part of God, oh. and this comes back to this this notion of separation. Yeah, that 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 is a lovely point in the movie, actually. I, I, yeah, that was one that I did really 
really love. I suppose I will, I will be keeping the word evil in my vocabulary, but I understand what you're saying and what, what you're uh, referring to. I think what we're going through in facing fear as a global um, society, culture, civilization experience mm -hmm. is to actually readjust our relationship to evil. I mean, in its broadest sense. Um, oh, crikey, you know, look, <laughs> there's so much, there's so much to worry about at the moment. I mean, uh, you've got, uh, you've got Ukraine, you've got climate change, you've got, um, really, you know, you've got this horrendous situation, Tim, where people, people, th this term heat or eat, I mean, how, oh, how, how big is this? Well, Coming up to winter in, in the Northern Hemisphere, as you are, people are saying, I can afford to eat or I can afford to heat my premises, you know, and not freeze. And not freeze. Now, to not have the basic fundamental um, elements of, of, of living, you know, of having food, sustenance, and being able to sit around a fire and keep warm, what's happened with our society? We have, you know, throughout this world, we have extraordinary wealth, unbelievable wealth. And yet we have this situation where so many people are faced with this, with, with, with what I see as something quite obscene, you know, that, 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 that this could be allowed to happen. But equally, that has been happening for, for centuries, if not right since the beginning of civilization, because what the difference is now is that it's happening to what we call the, the modern world, the, the, you know, the world that is not the third world as it used to be called. Uh, we've had starving millions, unfortunately, for a long, long time, you know. I mean, so, and, and you called it obscene, which I agree. Um, it is. Um, but I equally, I would use the word, you know, there's an, there's an evil that's driving that, but it is a process of change, you know, and actually the fact that we are now experiencing what the third, third world, I don't know what the official terminology is now for the third world, so I'm going to continue calling it the third world. But what's happening now is that we are experiencing in this civilization, in this part of the world, what they have been experiencing for a long time. And so, you know, if we want change, if we want an evolving species, which is what we believe is happening, then we have to go through the pain of change and the pain of chaos, which is what we're seeing. Now, that pain is not going to stop, but the way of uh, working with it is on an individual basis. Because if we're looking at life as a spiritual being and being you know, a point of experience of the universe, then we have to actually consider each individual world, each individual experience for its own properties, God being part of that. You know, we have to care for everybody amongst us. But when we look at the experience of the individual, what is that individual experiencing? That, that inability to pay their bills is an expression of an emotional, response that they are sending out to the world, to the universe through the subtle energies that then is manifesting back in their environment on an individual basis. So as Paul would say, Paul Selig would say, it's about re-seeing for the, each individual and trying to address and re-see and uh, assess and process from a new way, way of, of being. But, and that's what we need to be helping everybody with is to actually, if we really believe this stuff that, that you talk about in Facing Fear the movie, we actually need to be educating people, helping people see the reality of what they are individually. Um, well, we come back to compassion and empathy and love, um, really, when it comes down to it. Yeah. And yeah. Dare, dare I use the word charity? Yeah. Mm. In making your movie, you, 
what do you think was your what was your fundamental driver in actually saying right i'm going to make this movie about fear because you started it some years ago mm. um look my my basic um my basic driving force is very selfish and that is curiosity um i don't make these films to change the world i don't make these films to um help people um i don't make these films for any sort of um noble purposes it's incredibly selfish i'm curious um and i'm fortunate in that i've got myself into a position where i can knock on the doors of some very important people and they will let me in and they'll sit down and talk to me now how cool is that Fantastic. <laughs> How cool is that? You know, so um, so I feel I'm very lucky in that respect. And then through my curiosity, if other people can, um, you know, if, if they can get something from that, then then that's that's fabulous. But I don't make the film for other people. I make I make the I make these films purely for myself. So this is really really interesting, Bill, because I was talking to a a, a really creative, lovely artist the other day and she was saying you know um that that's the role of the artist is to actually do something that is that they're really connected to it's a very selfish pursuit but equally part of the role of the artist is to then say there it is for you there it is for you take what you will from that and, and that's what you've just said is is exactly that which means that you're fulfilling your role as a human being as bill bennett um <laughs> well number number one i rail at this term artist i would uh, hate to i would hate to think that i'm an artist um i'm a i'm a bloke who's developed certain skills and i i fulfill those you know i, I try and use those skills in the most um in a in a way that excites me if you like um so there's that um i want people to like the film there's no doubt about that of course you know now that it's all finished i want people to like the film um and did i make certain decisions in the particularly in post production and film like this to have people like the film probably um because in the end my my job my purpose um is to be a communicator i'm not a teacher i'm not a healer um none of these things i'm a communicator you know so what i do is i i i'm like a dog with a bone you know i'll um i'll take the subject of fear and i'll look at it from a whole lot of different perspectives i'm i'm like a I'm like a a diamond cutter looking at a lump of rock going how can I how can I see this rock in its perfect form and not and not kill it you know not destroy it and there's only one one interview in any of those in that whole movie in that 90 minutes that you've got now which I think oh would would I would I? Would I? Would dare I put myself into your position? Had I made this movie, um, mm -hmm. would I have kept that interview in? Mm -hmm. that? It's the lady who talked about doing the CPR. About oh, yeah. oh, oh, Tim, Tim, Tim. Every time, every time I watch that interview, I have <laughs> tears in my eyes. That's the one you love, isn't it? I, I... Uh, it brings me to tears every time. Oh, it, it's, it's to me it's one of the highlights of the film. Right? Yeah, and, and like this is why. Sorry, this is why I'm a writer, producer, director, because I've got nobody telling me what the f to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, I can I can go with well, Tim. You know, look, I respect your views, mate. You know, you're a highly intelligent, you know, incredibly sensitive person. But f off. <laughs> exactly. I might get that in the movie. Exactly. But to me, it's in the wrong movie. It should have been in your other one, in PGS. Yeah, it's interesting that. Um, 
because some people have have said that, but it's um, but it's about but it's a it's about. It's, you know? it's, Sorry, mate. Uh, sorry, I interrupted you. I mean, uh, you see, I, 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 I can't stand feeling as though I'm putting somebody down because I'm not criticising, but I'll, you know that. So um, believe me, I'm, I'm more robust than that. I know, I know <laughs> this, is, um, this is a reflection of me being not robust. Uh, it, it, I know why, as a filmmaker, you've left it in, and I can see why, as a, as a man who experienced a similar version to that experience that she describes yourself um on several occasions actually why you would want to leave it in um but that's the only point and actually as a reflection of how well the movie's made it's as tight as a button you know um and that was the only point and the fact is that she only appears the once so you know that's me being hypercritical uh <laughs> i want people to watch the movie and they can make up their own minds about that particular aspect but that's the filmmaking aspect i think it's really interesting that you are uh, and and I do love that that you were very happy to sit there and say I did this for me um, because that means that you know who you are and that's a real that's really important for people to to know who they are. You know, I'll tell you something. Um, I don't know whether we talked about this last time or not, but I've now decided to make um, three more films like this. Have I told you this before? You mentioned that you were wanting to make one on hope. Yeah. So I've decided that to expand it. So I did intuition first, then fear, this this film on fear. The next one I want to be on hope. Then I want to do one on, on purpose, mm. Mm. your path through life. And then the last one is on the veil. So five films in total. And if I can do that, then I'll I'll believe that my work here is done okay um, they'll all be the same style um exactly they'll all follow the same very distinctive style um and in a sense all of them are linked by the store by the journey of the soul mm. in a sense all of all of them are about the soul's journey and what the soul wants and that's what really interests me. Um, now, I never, I, I never wanted to be in these movies. I don't know whether I told you that or not. When I did, when I did, when I did the first film on PGS, I uh, on intuition, um, I finished the cut of the film, and I wasn't in the film at all. Uh, it was a more tra traditional kind of uh, cut. I then took the film around Australia and overseas and I showed the cut to a lot of people and the one resounding note that came back was, what about you? Where do you fit into all of this? We want to see you. Anyway, I railed against that because I, I, didn't, want to, I didn't want to be in the movie. I wanted to stand outside of it because I knew that if I was in the movie, then my life would change. I didn't want to change my life. Um, and I sat on it for about six weeks over, over the Christmas New Year period. I, I just mulled it over and mulled it over and finally I realised that, that I had to and that I couldn't hide. You know, that, that, I, that I had to, I had to personalise it um, if for no other reason but to give people um, an identifiable entry point into the material, which is really quite complex at times. I try and I try and make it simple without dumbing it down, but it, but you know they're fairly fairly lofty ideas in both these films, yeah. and they will be in the three that follow. But um, but I never wanted to be in the film, and and I and I but now now having stuck my head up above the hedge line, <laughs> you know, um, um, I'm, um, I'm committed to it and I'm going to f follow through with it. I have to say that you do a, you do a particularly good light, a good, good, uh, you do a good moody look. Um, I noticed that you haven't yet ventured into actually speaking to camera. It's all voiceover. Yeah. 
And that's very purposeful. Um, there's not one decision made in these films that that I don't give a huge amount of thought to. I mean, look, Facing Fear took three years. PTS took five years. Um, these are very, very considered pieces of work. Um, they're not works of art, they're pieces of work. <laughs> um, but um, I, I do that for a number of reasons. One is because oftentimes during the making of the film, I don't know what the f I'm doing. I don't know where I am. I don't know who I am. I, I am still finding my way. And if at that point I put anything down on camera, it would later be need to be ill-considered. I'm, I'm not ready during the making of the film to really solidly be able to put my thoughts in order. And it's only after, well, this particular film has been six months in editing. PGS was nine months in editing. And it's only after I've, I've spent a considerable amount of time in editing that I start to get a full understanding of what the particular subject is about. Yeah. And then I can then I can go back and I can, you know, very carefully write um, those things. But the other reason is this, and that is that that um, these films aren't about me. Whilst I'm in the film, I'm an everyman. Yeah. I'm I'm, and in facing fear, I'm particularly still. Yeah. Um, you might notice that in PTS, I was driving all the time. With this, I'm still and I'm walking. Um, very, very few. I think there's only maybe one occasion when I'm in the car. Um, once again, that was a very deliberate choice. Um, but um, I am a blank statue that people can step into and extrapolate their own particular situation on. You do blank very well. Oh, I've work. I'm been working on blank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and no, I blank my forte. <laughs> yeah. It's. Uh, yeah, I, I, I aspire to blankness, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's great. The, the 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 energy of the film is is a, is is lovely. Um, it's consistent. It's it is intense. I, I will be um, recommending that everybody picked it up. But how's it going to be shown, Bill? Where where can people see it? Um, initially, it's a film that's been made for cinema, so it does play really well on the on the big screen. So initially, we're um, we're doing a cinema rollout in Australia, then we go to America, then we go to the UK. The plan is to do a cinema rollout in the UK after Easter next year. Right. Uh, and once once the film has sort of exhausted its uh, cinema potential, um, we'll then we'll then look at putting it online. Hey Tim, uh, we got uh, some good news uh, on the weekend, okay. and probably probably um, it hasn't been released yet. But the film's been invited to a gala presentation at the Illuminate Film Festival in Sedona, which is like the top, oh, the top I call it the Sundance of woo-woo. Um, Excellent. <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, kind of like the top festival for these sort of consciousness raising films. And so they're going to give it a gala presentation. They're putting it on in the, the main slot on the Saturday night, red carpet, the whole thing. So that's pretty cool. I think you've done a fantastic job. I don't want to be sycophantic, but you know, I'm going to be. Oh, no, no, please, please do. Please do. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely fine with that. I love sycophant, sycophancy, whatever the noun of it is. I, I think, I think there should be more of it, particularly when it's directed towards me. <laughs> Excellent. Um, we could talk forever. Um, uh, thank you, Bill. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, people can find you uh, billbennett.com, is that right? Um, billbennett.com.au for Australia. Yeah. Okay. Uh, obviously, we can encourage all of those uh, subscribers to this channel that are based in Australia to dig it out. It's on fan base, is that right? Um, the film is going out through Fan Force. Fan Force. Um, yeah, fan-force.com. G'day, my name is Bill Bennett. I've made a film called Facing Fear. 
It features some of the world's leading experts on fear, fear management. If you want to see the film, go to the link on this page right here. I think it's under here somewhere. <laughs> uh, click on click on the link. It's look. It's a weird kind of screening. This in that you've got to. The, the screening will only go ahead in the cinema if enough people buy tickets. There's what's called a tipping point. So we've got to reach that tipping point before the screening goes ahead. But do buy a ticket. Get your friends to buy a ticket because I say humbly, it's a bloody good film. Recently, I got some bad news. It catapulted me into fear. But I soon realised my fear would only make things worse. To deal with what I was facing, I first had to face my fear. So I set off around the world to find out all I could about fear. Fear is an important functional element of the biological imperative. It is what motivates us. Is it possible that what you think as energy can actually create the physics of reality? By the time you start thinking about something, your fears get hold of you. If we don't deal with that, it'll end up somewhere in our physical body. So the body is continually behaving as if that's happening now. In other words, the body will memorize that emotion and the body will become the mind of fear. Which is feeding any form of fear. Fear, 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 it's fed. I mean, every choice you make in fear will get you more of the same. I discovered there are two types of fear, real fear and false fear. It's the false fears that are killing us. I learned how to handle these fears. And I also learned that not all fear is bad. Fear can be a motivating force for us to want to make changes. Well, let's actually lean into the boogeyman. What is the boogeyman? Why is the boogeyman here? How can I dance with the boogeyman? I started out choked with fear. Now I'm no longer afraid. Come with me on my journey. You don't have to live in fear.